Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Interim Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Frederick Logeval, a UO alumnus and professor of history at Cornell University. He also serves as Cornell's Vice Provost for International Affairs and as the director of Mario Anaudi Center <laughs> for International Studies. Logeval's recent book, Embers of War, the Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam received the 2013 Pulitzer Prize for History. Logeval gave a talk titled The Meaning of the Vietnam War on May 14, 2014 as a guest of the Wayne Morse Center for Law and Politics as part of the Wayne Morse Legacy series commemorating this year the 50th anniversary of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Thank you so much for speaking with uh, us it's today. It's a pleasure to be here. So what was the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution? The resolution was passed overwhelmingly by both houses of Congress in August of 1964 in response to uh, an incident in the Gulf of Tonkin off, off the coast of North Vietnam. This was at a time when the United States was beginning to uh, consider uh, expanding its role in the war. There were, uh, shall we say, murky events in the Gulf. Uh, on, on a particular a pair of days in early August, and in response to those developments, alleged North Vietnamese attacks on, on U.S. boats, uh, Congress passed uh, this resolution, which essentially gave Lyndon Johnson, President of the United States, a kind of blank check, gave him great authority to escalate the war as he saw fit in Southeast Asia. and. It's really, in that respect, a very important transition to a large-scale American war. So when we, when when Americans think about the war, they they think about um, 1964, the 60s, That's the right. Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, but the temporal scope of your most recent book, The Embers of War, is from 1919 to 1959. Yeah. Why? Well, my sense was that in our rush to get to America's war, historians, myself very much included had given short shrift to this earlier period. And I, and I knew from my teaching uh, at UC Santa Barbara, where I used to be, and now at Cornell, I knew from my teaching, from my reading, even to some extent from my previous research, that the earlier period, and in particular the French War, which as you know preceded the American War, we're talking about two wars really mm -hmm. in Indochina, I knew that that earlier struggle was uh, important in its own right, and in particular, even if we wanted in particular to uh, understand and to focus on the U.S. phase, we wouldn't really get a, a good grasp of it until we looked closely at that earlier period. And so s that's what I set out to do in this book, um, and hopefully what I, can, what, I, what I do is show the reader why if we do want to um, appreciate, if we want to have a, a kind of fundamental understanding of why the United States found itself in this place, we've got to pay close attention to that earlier period. So the book begins with a short preface on John Kennedy's visit to Indochina in 1951 yeah. when he was 34 years old. Yeah. Why did you begin there? Well, I mean, it's, for me, it, when, I, when I came upon his diary, which is in the Kennedy Library in Boston, and I saw in his own handwriting his um, very candid and I think penetrating remarks about that visit. I thought, I've got to use this in some fashion. <laughs> and I used it at the beginning of the book because right there in 1951, long before he was president, about a decade before he became president, John F. Kennedy, this young man, asked penetrating questions about what the French were doing, can the French possibly succeed? I think by extension, uh, JFK was saying, could any Western power succeed in this part of the world in um, uh, combating by military means revolutionary nationalism? And at least implicit in that diary is his view, John F. Kennedy's view, that the answer is no. The French are not going to succeed. By extension, the U.S. won't succeed. And he said, the more, and I'm paraphrasing here, the more we associate ourselves with the cause of French colonialism, the worse off we'll be in terms of winning the support of the people in this part of the world. So what I mean to show in opening the book with this is that there were these doubts 
on the part of a lot of people in France, in the United States. And yet I also want to suggest that there's a paradox because this same president, a decade later, would oversee a large, not the, not the full escalation of the war that we see under, under Lyndon Johnson, but nevertheless would take steps toward creating this large-scale American war. And there's a, there's a kind of paradox there which in some respects I deal with in the rest of the book, showing how the United States, step by step, first in support of the French, and then after the French had been defeated uh, on their own, step by step uh, moved into, into Vietnam. So as a way of beginning to get to that place, yeah. um, the preface is followed by a prologue, mm -hmm. which takes place in June 1919, at the gathering in Paris of world leaders who would shape the peace and the First World War. We have the centenary of the First World War right now. Yeah. With a young Vietnamese hmm. man who hoped to meet and speak with yeah. Woodrow Wilson. Who was that young man yeah. and why is he so important to your story? Well, he's a young man who would become known to the world as Ho Chi Minh. Certainly one of the most important nationalists, one of the most important or important I would say international figures of the of the 20th century. Here he is in 1919 as you say. Nobody's heard of this guy before, nobody knows him, and he is already a committed dedicated uh, nationalist, wants independence for Vietnam from the French, has been inspired by Woodrow Wilson and by Wilson's pronouncements that he wants to make the world safe for democracy. He wants to see self, national self-determination for peoples. And Young Ho, as he would become known, Young Ho says, I've got to see this guy. <laughs> and so he rents, uh, it's, a, it's just a remarkable story, he rents a morning coat because he wants to look respectable. And he sets off, and, and you know, I sometimes imagine what this would have been like. He sets off uh, for the conference wants to get an audience with this great American leader. Of course, he doesn't get to see him. To my knowledge, doesn't get to see any of the, the main allied, uh, main, main uh, Western leaders. And it's, um, I guess you could say it's the first of several what ifs that we could discuss, which is suppose, in fact, he had gotten that audience. Would it have made a difference? Would the course of history have changed? Um, but what we know is that he didn't. Mm -hmm. and steadily he becomes more radicalized. He comes to realize, although it takes him a long time, uh, he comes to realize ultimately that he can't depend on the United States for um, active support for his cause. So when did the French begin their colonial enterprise in Indochina and w why? In a serious way they begin in the middle phase of the middle part of the 19th century. Um, Several different reasons, I would say. Uh, part of it is geostrategic. Mm -hmm. There is a determination on the part of Paris officials that we need to keep up with the, uh, if you will, the imperialistic Joneses in the sense that we need to uh, be in this part of the world. The British in particular are, are, are making a stand mm -hmm. elsewhere in the region. We got to be part of this game. So that's a motivation. There's also a business, um, um, a business proposition, if you will. There is uh, a push on the part of uh, industrialists and others in France to have access uh, to the raw materials of Indochina, eventually perhaps the markets of Indochina. So there's that push. And also, I think to a lesser extent, a, a missionary impulse, that there is an opportunity here to, 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 to save, save the heathen for, for Christianity. Those things, I think, all come together for the French. And what happens is by the end of the century, by about the middle part of the 1890s, turn of the century, they have solidified their control over what they're now calling French Indochina, which is Vietnam, divided into three parts. It's Cambodia and it's Laos. So World War I comes, interwar period, World War II. What happens to French colonial rule in Indochina? Well, over a period of time, and this is something that I, that, I, uh, that I trace in the book, the French colonial position is, is weakened. Um, I suggest in the book that we should not, um, uh, we should not put the, the decline at too early a point. And what I mean by that is that some historians have suggested 
that even at the end of World War I, mm -hmm. uh, the, the essential demise of the empire can be seen. Uh, I don't think that's right. I would acknowledge that the seeds of the ultimate collapse of the empire were, were already planted. Its spirit more and more contrary, its racist spirit more and more contrary to the, to the spirit of the times. Mm -hmm. But I think it's only in the interwar period, and especially as a result of World War II, mm -hmm. the Second World War, that that French colonial um, uh, position becomes really, really tenuous. And the big reason for that is that France is overrun, as you know, in six short weeks in Europe in 1940 by the Germans. The Japanese swoop in to Indochina uh, in, in to, to Southeast Asia to take advantage of this. They take de facto control. And even though they allow the French to maintain day-to-day -day, um, political power yeah. in Indochina, everybody knows who has the real power, and it's the Japanese. And the French never really recover from this. They think they can recover after World War II, which of course is what brings on this large-scale war. And de Gaulle and other French leaders are, de are determined to reclaim Indochina for France. But I think they have been really, really undermined by the outcome of the Second World War. And then the last thing to say here is that the Viet Minh, which is Ho Chi Minh's revolutionary organization, come out of the Second World War um, much strengthened. And so they benefit in that respect from the outcome of that war. So how does the war, how does the French Indochina War get going? I mean, you just said, okay, so the, the, the French want to reassert their colonial power, Ho Chi Minh, they see an opportunity. So what's the, what, what brings, what, what makes it happen? Well, what we really have is a collision of nationalisms. Mm -hmm. So the French, I think largely for reasons of, of prestige and of a desire to be part of the great power club, they're determined to go back in and reclaim control. There are nationalists, however, in Vietnam, and Ho Chi Minh is the most formidable among those nationalists. Although we should note that there are non-communist nationalists, there are various groups competing for that mantle mm -hmm. uh, in Vietnam. And so the Viet Minh is by no means alone. But, it, but the Viet Minh comes out of the war, as I suggested a while ago, in, a, in an especially strong position. And you have these two forces that basically collide. And I do think, by the way, that there's an, uh, there's an opportunity here potentially for the United States. I call August of 1945 in my book The Open Moment, mm -hmm. when because of the U.S. power position at the end of the Second World War, a determined U.S. opposition to a forcible French uh, return might have made a very, very meaningful difference. But the Americans are not willing to do that. And so you have, li uh, bit by bit, these two colliding nationalisms uh, coming closer together. There's an attempt in Paris uh, in the middle months of 1946, absolutely fascinating, when Ho Chi Minh travels to Paris, tries to get a political solution in place that will prevent a war. He's unsuccessful, and then the real fighting begins really in December of 1946. So how long is it before the French start to realize that mm. they've got a problem? Some French uh, commanders and other analysts see from the very beginning, we've got a problem. And the problem in part, they realize, is manpower. That you're just not going to be able to have, partly for domestic political reasons in France, you're not going to be able to have uh, conscripts. You're not going to be able to have a large number of troops. Uh, and until you can get a much greater manpower presence, you really won't be able to at least have a, a kind of long-term military um, solution favoring the French. But that's a minority view. I think most French uh, civilian leaders and even military leaders in the early going, so 47, even 1948, think we can subdue the Viet Minh. We're much stronger than they are militarily. We have great technological advantage. Uh, they're a, a bunch of you know barefoot uh, guerrillas, they will not be able to compete with what the French can bring to the, to the table. So they think that you can isolate the Viet Minh, uh, you can uh, uh, little by little strengthen the French uh, hold on the key parts of Vietnam, in the north, in the center, and in the south, um, and that way win the war. By 49, and certainly by 1950, I think uh, 
when they're being honest, when the doors are closed in those Paris, uh, you know, in the halls of power, I think they're acknowledging to themselves, this thing is just not going to go well, time is not on our side, we've got to think of some other solution to this, and yet the war lasts another four years. So how do the French get out? How do they unwind themselves? <sighs> well, they unwind themselves by tacitly coming around to the idea of a, of a negotiated solution. For a long time, they resist uh, diplomatic uh, engagements with Ho Chi Minh, but they come to realize that we have no alternative but to do this. So that's one factor here. Uh, militarily, the situation gets more and more precarious for them because even though they're getting huge, uh, huge assistance from the United States, the Viet Minh are now getting assistance from the Chinese. The war has become much more internationalized after 1950. And uh, I think the French realize we have just got to now hold out for some kind of negotiated solution that at least gives us a portion of Vietnam. In other words, they reduce their objectives. And when Pierre Mendes Franz comes in uh, in 1954, he basically says, I will secure an agreement within 30 days or I will resign. And that's what he does. The French are defeated at a climactic battle at Dien Bien Phu, one of the great military encounters of, of modern times. There's a, c uh, there's a conference at, the, at Geneva that, that begins more or less at the same time, and at that conference, we get a, a settlement that, surprisingly enough, given their bad uh, military position, surprisingly enough gives the French actually a pretty good deal for themselves. They do retain a non-communist uh, hold in the southern part of Vietnam. There is the prospect, at least for a moment, of continuing French political uh, influence. But that's how they get themselves out, and that's when we see the end of what we come to call the First Indochina War, the French Indochina War. So, okay, so then what do we do? What does the U.S. do at that point? Okay, so the war's over. Yeah. What well, then? Eisenhower and Dulles make a very fateful decision. I should say, by the way, that more so than most historians, I believe the U.S. came close to intervening militarily already in 1954. Mm -hmm. So I think Eisenhower and Dulles actively consider military intervention to try to, to save the French position. The British refuse to go along, and that basically ends that possibility. But Eisenhower and Dulles say, we are going to build up and sustain, and if necessary, defend a non-communist bastion in the southern part of Vietnam, and that's what they do. And then, some years later, that's how the United States becomes involved militarily in Vietnam. So you've mentioned um, a number of these what-if moments mm. that come up in your book. So what if Ho Chi Minh had met with Wilson in 1919? What if FDR had not died in 45? What if Eisenhower had supported an election in Vietnam in 56? Would you care to offer any speculations on any one of those what-ifs? Yeah. Well, you've already sort of implied that yeah. if, if uh, Ho Chi Minh had met with yeah. Wilson, maybe there would have been no... Yeah. Or well, I think I should say first off that considering these what-ifs, if we do it carefully, so-called counterfactual analysis, I think in fact can have considerable historical utility. So unlike many academic historians, I actually think that we should be doing this. We mm -hmm. shouldn't shy away from these things. Plus, they're just interesting. Mm -hmm. They're just fun to, 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 to speculate about. But in all seriousness, I think uh, maybe I'll choose the, uh, the FDR example. I suggest toward the end of the book that it's not fanciful to believe that had he lived beyond 1945, given his opposition to allowing the French to return to Indochina, number one, given secondly his, his deep belief, FDRs, that the age of colonialism had passed and that the United States risked being on the wrong side of history if it supported European colonialism. Given those things, had he lived beyond 45, I don't think it's fanciful to believe that he would have opposed uh, a military return by the French at least, that he might have succeeded in opposing that military return. That one is contentious, I admit. But if he had done that, he would have changed the course of history. Now, people will say, well, he didn't live beyond 45, and that's true. He died, and we have to deal with the fact that Truman, 
uh, felt differently about this, didn't have the same kinds of convictions. But that very fact, I think, underscores the utility, again, of, 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 of what ifs. We get a sense that this presidential transition, you know, it actually matters. Um, to, to approach this a slightly different way, so yeah. the, the 20th century philosopher George Santayana famously writes, mm -hmm. those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. When you think about the U.S.'s current war in Afghanistan, are there lessons from uh, your research on mm -hmm. Vietnam that we fail to remember? I think there are. Uh, I do think um, even if we should be careful about, you know, throwing around phrases like the lessons of history and, you know, if we only could to adopt this and apply it here, uh, because one of the things we, we I think, um, most historians believe is that every situation has a, uh, has a unique dimension. Nevertheless, uh, I would say maybe, maybe one thing in particular. I do think the Vietnam example um, has, a, has a, a particular connection to Afghanistan, since that's the example you use. So that if you think about uh, Vietnam in, say, the late 1960s, we have a, a, a U.S.-supported government under Q in South Vietnam that is unable to win broad uh, support uh, on the part of the population. Um, that has difficult, has a very difficult time uh, uh, achieving security without massive involvement by the United States. That is plagued by corruption. And you compare that to more recently the Karzai government in Afghanistan. I think you see interesting similarities. And what it suggests to me is that if you cannot have a uh, an allied government on the on the scene, the, 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 the local host government, if you will. If that government does not have broad political support, does not have a fundamental level of support, is not able or willing, perhaps, to do its part in terms of its own defense, I think it's a recipe for, uh, for real problems. That's, I think, what we see from Vietnam, uh, and I think you can see some really important similarities between that case to you in the late 60s mm -hmm. and the Karzai government, more, uh, Karzai government more recently in Afghanistan. Uh, you earned your MA in history from the University of Oregon. Yes. Are there any professors or courses you took at uh, UO that played a significant role in no. your trajectory as a historian? It was hugely important for me to be here. It was a two-year program, um, just a, a superb MA program. Uh, I had come in, obviously, with a bachelor's degree like everybody else in this MA program and felt, like many students, that I had a good sense of what I needed to do, and I thought, you know, this is just a matter of doing research and writing it up. And I learned here through tremendous faculty, Glenn May, uh, Jack Maddox, uh, Professor Maddox, as we call him, taught a, a, a methods class, historiography and methods. That was just really, really difficult. And we complained, as grad students do, about what Maddox was making us do, you know, week after week. But I came to realize belatedly, as one does, that, you know, everything from how to do research. So he, he, you know, he had us take note cards and we would have to learn how to fill in on note cards because we didn't have the kind of software then that we do now. But, 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 uh, but more importantly, teaching us research methods that even in this day, uh, even, even, even today, with the technology that we have is just tremendously useful. And then Glenn May, who I mentioned in terms of being my advisor, helping me to, to, to fashion a topic focused on the Vietnam War, allowing me to, to be his TA and working for him in that respect. Um, it was a great program. And it set me on my way. I then went uh, elsewhere for my, for my doctorate. But I think that the MA program here was as important uh, as that doctoral work that I did subsequently. Excellent. Um, can you tell us about what you're working on now? So the next book um, is going to be a biography of, of John F. Kennedy. So you mentioned earlier that I opened the book, uh, Embers of War, with Kennedy in Vietnam at, uh, at that young age of 34. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, there's a sizable literature <laughs> on John F. Say. Kennedy already. <laughs> and this is true. <laughs> but I hope that I have something to say. It's going to be his whole life. It's going to be uh, 
it's going to be very much life and times, which means that I want to, in addition to obviously giving the reader a full biography of, of, of JFK, I want, for example, to trace, uh, and I think you can use Kennedy's life. Uh, you can map the rise of the United States from great power status to superpower status. Mm -hmm. Arguably even the zenith of its uh, uh, power in, 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 in global terms on his life. He's born in 1917, right after U.S. entry into World War I. He dies, of course, in 1963. And so I want to, in this book, also write this as, as yes, the rise of the United States to this to this position that, in some respects, makes it uh, the most powerful country in global political and geopolitical terms that the world has ever seen, and that fascinates me. And I think Kennedy, uh, Kennedy is part of that story, and that's what I want to try to bring out. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, I guess I'm going to ask you a counterfactual yeah. question. Yeah. Um, wh what do you think would have happened if Kennedy hadn't been assassinated? Well, I think um, I think it's another you know it's an excellent counterfactual for historians to consider. It meets certain ground rules for for for, for serious counterfactual study. One of them is that many of the things that would have happened in Vietnam um, uh, under JFK would have happened at roughly the same time that it, that they happened with LBJ. And the most important one of those is that I think the key moment of decision for a, for a surviving JFK would have come when they came for LBJ. I believe that, th that a surviving Kennedy would not have opted for the same kind of large-scale American escalation that LBJ did. He was a different human being. His doubts about the war went deeper. He used his advisors differently. And most importantly, he would have made those decisions in his second and final term as president. Whereas for Johnson, it was still effectively his first term. Mm -hmm. So he had to think about the domestic political ramifications Kennedy would not have. Well, on that fascinating speculative moment, I want to thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. I've been speaking with Frederick Logaval, professor of history at Cornell University and author of Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of American, America's Vietnam. Logaval gave a talk titled The Meaning of the Vietnam War on May 14, 2014, as a guest of the Wayne Morse Center for Law and Politics. Join me next time when I speak with uh, cybersecurity guru Bruce Schneier. Thanks so much for watching.